breaking down Western Illinois. We've got to talk about our opponents. You've got to know your enemy when it comes to week two, which we'll do today on Locked On Golden Gophers. Hey, you are no Locked happens, On Golden Gophers. No matter what we're going to do here, we're just going to keep rowing. Your daily podcast on the Minnesota uh, Golden out, Gophers. Whatever turns out, we're just going to keep rowing. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're just going to keep rowing, keep rowing, and keep rowing. You're listening to Locked On Golden Gophers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Kane Robb, host of the podcast, former collegiate football video coordinator and recruiting assistant, here to talk Golden Gophers with you each and every day of the week, Monday through Friday. Now, yesterday I did not come on the show because I was feeling under the weather. We're, we're recovering slowly, but I had to get back on the show for you. So today we are talking about breaking down our opponent and knowing your enemy. But first, be sure to find the podcast wherever you get your podcast, whether that be Apple Pods, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, you name it. Find us at Lockdown Golden Gophers. And be sure to subscribe on YouTube and find the show there. Join the community that we're building up. So we're going to dive right into it. We're talking about the opponent breakdown. And in the last full three seasons, the last three full seasons, uh, this Western Illinois team has gone 8-26 and 26 in the last three full seasons. They have played five games versus Big Ten schools in the last decade and were 0-5. In 2013, they lost to Minnesota. 2014, they lost to Wisconsin and Northwestern. 2015, they lost to Illinois. In 2018, they lost to Illinois. Now, each of these matchups, they lost by three scores or more. Now, the Western Illinois Leathernecks also have a new coach and defensive coordinator. The head coach is Myers Hendrickson. He is a former player and alum of the university, and he previously coached at Kansas Wesleyan University, which is an NAIA school, where he went 30-4 and during his time there and won two of the conference championships while there. Now, again, that was an NAIA program, which is lower than Division Three, So now he is taking three steps up to the FCS Division I level. Um, it, it's quite a leap, especially as a head coach. Now he has experience prior as an offensive coordinator at Kansas Wesleyan as well. He has uh, OC experience at Northern and he has OC experience at Co College. So he has it at <clears throat> the... NAIA D2 and D3 levels. He has experience as an offensive coordinator during his time from 2015 to 2019, but now he's jumping up to the D1 FCS. Not quite the big leagues, but almost there. Um, So it's quite the jump. It's a big leap, and we'll see how that coaching change goes. Now, his team at Kansas Wesleyan featured conference and school records for the most points, most yards in a single game, both of those being in a single game, 90 points in a single game, and 793 yards in a single game, as well as season marks in passing yards for 4,089 passing yards. Now in 2020, the team finished top 10 in the country in nine offensive categories. So he does have some gusto to him when he gets it done, when he grows in the area that he's in, when he adapts to his environment. So this coach could bring something to them, but this is year one. This is game two. This is against a Big Ten opponent. So it's going to be a big leap for him, especially being his first Big Ten game coaching against. Now, I mentioned the defensive coordinator is also new. That is Todd Dury. He was the head coach for Missouri Science and Technology. Also was the D.C. there prior. His defense was among the top 10 in the Great Lakes Valley Conference, allowing league bests of 292.2 yards per game in 2018 and 294.3 yards per game in 2017. So at their levels, they've done well and found success, but will they be able to at the FCS level? That is 
to be determined. They did struggle in game one, but again, it was game one. But going up against a Big Ten opponent will be a big leap for them and a lot to ask of new coaches at this level. Now, next, I want to talk about the tendencies, talking about the analysis of this coach, this coaching regime of this program. But first, I want to talk to you about our friends at Underdog. Now, Underdog is the easiest and most fun way to spice up your season. Underdog Fantasy in their pick'em game for college football. All you have to do is look for your favorite gophers, stats, and pick whether you think they'll end up with higher or lower than that number in this week's game. And you can win up to 20 times your money in a single night. Underdog keeps it super simple with their easy-to-use website and mobile apps. You can pick between two and five players for your pig, for your pick em slip <clears throat> and get all your picks right, and you'll take home some cold, hard cash. It's simple to get started. Just go to underdogfantasy.com or download the app and sign up with promo code Locked On. And Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. Deposit $100 and get $100 free. That's Underdog Fantasy, promo code locked on. All right, so we're going to dive into the tendencies and the uh, a little bit of analysis for the Western Illinois football program. In 2019, Hendrickson, the new head coach, his offense saw 4,198 passing yards and 2,565 rushing yards. His offense averaged 323 passing yards per game in 2019 and 321 passing yards per game in 2020. Now, in game one, the run-pass split was 42% run, 58% pass, but once again, this could be due to playing from behind. That said, it does seem like Hendrickson overall does prefer the passing offense. <clears throat> One thing to point out with his team, noticing from the first game, was that they had two quarterbacks, each had 19 attempts. Davenport was 9 for 19, had 180 yards, three touchdowns, and one interception. And then Ogala has 12 for 19, so a better passing percentage or completion percentage but only 105 yards and one touchdown, plus one interception. Now, these quarterbacks also accounted for 11 of the 27 rushing attempts the team had, which is 40% of the rushing attempts came from the quarterbacks, and 70% of the rushing yardage came from the quarterbacks. <clears throat> so when we're looking at strengths, there's no clear starter. Again, so we'll have to prep for two quarterbacks similar to last week, and both quarterbacks seem like they can be a threat in the run and pass games. That's something that <clears throat> the Gophers haven't had to deal a whole lot with this past season and even early on now. And so that ability to run, to be a threat with their legs, could present itself as a strength when playing the Gophers. Now, a weakness is that they're less caliber of athletes Lower division of football, it, we're playing an inferior competition, so they haven't really won any game or came anywhere near it when it comes to playing a Big Ten opponent. In fact, they've always been at least three scores or more behind when they play a Big Ten opponent. Also, another weakness is the run game. It was very inefficient. It was very lackluster. In game one, they had three running backs take... Uh, take attempts and on those 15 attempts by the running backs there was a 2.3 yard per carry in 35 rush yards total so the ground game was basically <clears throat> ineffective it was basically useless in their game against another fcs opponent so going up against one of the best defenses in the fbs i can't imagine that they're going to find very much success and it's going to be a tough day for him. <clears throat> now, opportunity-wise, our secondary should have the opportunity to get more work and prove that they are as elite as they have been touted this offseason. Yes, it's an FCS school, but we can use this game to truly test the aspect that we weren't tested with in Game 1. So, 
New Mexico only had 12 pass attempts in that game. I anticipate we're going to see a lot more, at least, attempts by this Western Illinois team, which will put our DBs and our secondary more actively in this game and proving that they are the real deal, that they can shut down, that they can lock down, especially their number one receiver who went off. Now, threats-wise, the only threat I see from this team is not handling this matchup could be or could place doubt upon the recent respect that the Gophers team has been earning from that week one victory. The defense has been getting a lot of love, and if we don't go out there and shut down this team, just like we shut down New Mexico State, we might not get as much respect or love. Now, I'm not saying it has to be a shutout, but what I'm saying is hold them to very few yardage. Hold them to maybe a single score or less. Hold them... (coughs) to minimal gains, that's what we're going to need to do from a defensive perspective because see Iowa, see, I mean, Iowa looked great on the defensive end playing a higher caliber FCS school, but their offense looked tragic and they've gotten the end, they've been on the raw end of things when it comes to Talking about week one, who are contenders, who are pretenders, especially in our conference, Iowa has been hard to judge because they looked so ineffective against an FCS opponent. Now, this FCS opponent is lower than the one they played, so we have to take care of business. Now, the last opponent that this Western Illinois team took on was UT Martin or University of Tennessee Martin. They lost 42-25. to They gave up 268 passing yards or 268 rushing yards, excuse me, and 285 passing yards. They had two interceptions and gave up two sacks. Their third down efficiency was three for 13, and their fourth down efficiency was one for three. Each one of Western Illinois' four touchdowns in week one were all explosive plays, a 31-yard pass, a 32-yard pass, a 44-yard pass, and a 51-yard pass. So lots of explosives, but they had zero attempts in the red zone. Now to close up knowing your enemy, we're going to talk about the key players on both sides of ball. That's coming up next. All right. Thank you for listening to Locked On Golden Gophers and making us your first listen when it comes to Gophers Daily Sports. We're going to talk about key players on both sides of ball for the Western Illinois Leathernecks. We're going to start with the offense and kick it off with Nick Davenport, who is the quarterback. He saw nine for 19 attempts, 180 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. He also had eight rushing attempts for 62 yards. Now, he had some long bomb touchdowns, plus he has the ability to scramble. He might be the player that could give our D-line some trouble on the ground, which we will need to contain. That will be a stressor for us this week. That is one thing I mentioned with our defense. The only thing I thought maybe, just maybe, could be worrisome or an issue for this Gophers team would be a quarterback that could scramble all over the place and cause issues there. I don't know if he is of that caliber to really give us problems, but this will be a great test run, a great trial run for the Gophers defense on how they would handle containing quarterbacks who have the ability to use their legs effectively. So Nick Davenport is one guy I wanted to point out. Now, another player on the offensive side of ball that is a player I want to stress is Nassim Brantley. He was a wide receiver. He is a wide receiver. He had six receptions for 171 yards and three touchdowns. He has a connection with that quarterback I listed, uh, Nick Davenport. He also has speed to get behind the defense, and he accounted for 60% of the team's receiving yards production and had three of those four touchdowns. So definitely the guy that you want to hone in on defensively. Now on the flip side, on the defensive side of ball, Anthony Quinney had 15 tackles plus a tackle for loss in his week one. He's a transfer from Dodge City. He also had 61 tackles and 37 solo tackles in his time there in 2021. 
Now he already has 13 solo tackles in week one, in game one already. So he is very productive and will lead the tackling efforts for this team all season. The last player that I want to mention on the defensive side of the ball is cornerback J.J. Ross. He had three tackles and an interception, plus two pass breakups in the Week 1 matchup. He's six foot two, 195 pounds. He is solid size for a defensive back. He was the primary cornerback for Western Illinois last season and remains to be that this year. He showed his ability to showed his ability in coverage obviously in that game one having two pass breakups and an interception and he showed that he can be the guy for that defense so he will be a key player and a key factor on that side of ball overall this should be a game that the gophers have no trouble winning but these are the players to keep in mind this is kind of the breakdown of what they have showed previously in week one and the coaches prior to joining this program. I think we'll see more passing opportunities from the Western Illinois Leathernecks and we'll see them take more attempts at explosive plays, make more attempts at passing the ball, which will help us get warmed up, get flying, get going for this secondary, which is said to be one of the best in the nation, has been touted like that, and now it's time to go out there and prove it against an inferior FCS team. So it'll be a great matchup to see the Gophers really put themselves at the forefront of that best defense category. That's going to do it for us on today's show of Locked On Golden Gophers. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Tomorrow we will talk about the Gophers and the keys that they have for this week to to ensure victory and also to help themselves progress moving forward. So tomorrow we'll talk about the Gophers and their key factors.